I presented the, the, uh, the, the brief version of this at the Bunker Bay uh, retreat recently. What do you call it? Workshop? <laughs> um, so uh, for those of you, so you sort of saw the, uh, the, the summary version. This is sort of a more, more detailed version. Um, one of my main sort of areas of interest at the moment is my backfill. Um, but this, this sort of uh, is something, some work I did with David Muir Wood um, around about two or three years ago. Uh, and there seems to be a bit of interest in this model um, here, so I thought I'd sort of go through the detailed version of the, uh, of the presentation. Um, the presentation is sort of broadly about, um, it, it, it's in, in some, uh, some it's to some degree, it's about model detail, but to a large degree, it's about sort of model, modeling process and um, you know, the way we sort of go about dealing with uh, information that we have and how we process it and how we use it. In, in a sort of rational kind of way. So just as a bit of, bit of a brief outline, I'm going to talk about some foundation settlement prediction competitions that were conducted at the University of Western Australia test site uh, in about 2006, 2007. That was uh, before my time at university, or it was while I was actually in, uh, in the industry working. So I didn't actually have anything to do with running these footing prediction settlement competitions. Barry Lahan did all that, so I need to thank him for um, allowing me to use all the data. And it's actually a really, uh, really nice little, little study that he conducted. Uh, and the second part of the talk is about um, this extended more cooling model, which um, which I've which David you know, we developed and I implemented and, and we sort of applied to this this um, this interesting set of data that we that we have. So the footing settlement competition basically involved constructing four uh, shallow foundations. The details are given there. So footings one, two, three, four. Uh, widths range from uh, 1.5 meters down to 0.67 meters. Um, and they're the embedment depth. So most of all, uh, three of them were embedded at one metre, and uh, footing number three was embedded at half a metre. Um, there was all sorts of instrumentation installed around the footing, so there was um, there was settlement plates to record um, ground deformation um, uh, below the uh, footing center line. Um, the settlements of the foundations themselves were recorded, um, and that, that was sort of the major sort of thing. Um, the site itself is classified as early port sand, um, some um, particle size uh, details there, uh, water content. So basically it's about six or seven metres of sand overlying liquid cemented uh, limestone. Uh, the water table is quite low. Um, and yeah, uh, so average degree of saturation is about 40 percent and maximum void ratios and so on. Um, there's a whole heap of in-situ testing done um, prior to these uh, footings being load tested. Um, this included some CPT testing. Um, you can see some um, shear wave velocity data here, so seismic uh, cone testing, um, which you can use to derive small strain stiffness. Uh, and then there was some dilatometer testing as well, so the KD and the ED parameters that you get from, from dilatometer or dilatometer. Um, there were two triaxial compression tests conducted at uh, two different stress levels, so at both anisotropic consolidated triaxial compression tests, so um, at these stress levels, and these, these are the uh, stress strain uh, response from those two tests, test one and two, and the volumetric strain versus um, shear strain response. Um, some of these slides are from different uh, sources, so I sometimes use J as a shear stress uh, parameter, and sometimes I use Q as a shear stress, sorry, as a measure of shear stress, so Q and J are related um, just through the square root of 3, so um, you can just think of J and Q as, as shear stresses, it's not really important what they are. So basically, um, Barry ran this footing settlement prediction competition, and uh, so there was a sort of worldwide invitation for people to participate, and all the participants were uh, provided with uh, soil classification data, um, there was seismic cone and dilatometer data at each footing location. There was the triaxial uh, compression tests, and with those triaxial compression tests, we did bender element tests as well, so to get the small strain um, lab um, stiffness on, on the reconstituted material. Um, they were provided provide with a lot of detail on how the footings were constructed and then how they were going to be loaded. Um, and in return, what was asked of the uh, participants was they were asked to predict the settlement of each of the four foundations with a load of 100 kilonewtons and then again at 180 kilonewtons. So in all they're asked to sort of make eight predictions in a sense, so four footings, um, predictions with two different loads. And the footings were loaded up with a, um, with a 25 tonne CPT truck. Uh, so they were basically loaded up in increments of about 15 kilonewtons. There were some 
some hold periods. There's also some, you'll see later on when you see the data, there's some unload reload loops. I think all of those unload reload loops are intentional. Some of it was to do with um, some um, equipment uh, malfunction, but um, you can see there. So these are the, uh, this is the load displacement data uh, from all four footings. So footing number one, we, it's the largest footing, so at about 200 kilonewtons, we had around about five millimetres of settlement. Um, all the way down to footing number four, which is the smallest, uh, we had around about 40 millimetres of settlement under the same, under roughly the same load. Okay, so this is what people were asked to, to try and predict. Here is an example of what they came back with. So um, this is just looking at footing number four, so it's the smallest footing, uh, and we're looking at um, the two load cases they're asked to predict. So here's footing number four with a load of 100 kilonewtons and then a load of 180 kilonewtons. And the actual measured settlement was about 13 millimetres at 100 and 31 millimetres at 180. Um, and you can see here, <coughs> All the participants' predictions, they ranged from around about 90 millimetres down to about less than one millimetre uh, for a prediction of 13, uh, for an actual measured value of 13, and a similar sort of range when you got up to about 180 kilonewtons. So I'm not really sure what happened with um, participant number nine here. They sort of uh, expect about 90 millimetres with 100 kilonewtons and about the same at 180 kilonewtons. <laughs> Nearly double the load you get, almost no, no movement. Um, it's interesting to go back and have a look at how people actually uh, went about doing this. So um, there were 78 engineers that contributed to 26 submissions. So there were, there were team submissions. 50% were from the US, 60% were academic. So this is not really just describing a uh, problem with industry practitioners. This is, um, this is a problem um, that we have uh, you know, in, in the academic world as well. Uh, the methods used, there were 15 predict, different predictive methods used out of the 26 submissions. So, I mean, that's a bit like going to the doctor, 26 different doctors with a common cold and getting 15 different treatments. It's a bit, a bit um, it, it sort of shows you that there's no real um, accepted approach for this it's really common problem. The most popular method was the CPT-based Schmerber method, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Um, the next most popular method was the Berlin and Burbridge method, which uses SPT data to predict settlement. And there was no SPT data at the site, so people converted CPT into SPTN and, and, and went that way. And this is after providing them with this really nice triaxial data and all the rest of it, they, most people ignored it. Um, minority of submissions used, as I said, used the shear wave velocity DMT or triaxial data. Um, so some of the conclusions, our predictive capabilities are very poor, I think that's quite obvious. Um, so in a real predictive sense. Um, we can't attribute this to the site. So the site was very well characterised. It's not particularly unusual material. Um, and um, there's a lot, of lot of good information available. One of the problems I see with all these methods is that nearly all of them require an estimate of some operational elastic stiffness that represents the entire soil mass. So what they're essentially doing is not trying to predict the stiffness as such, or sorry, the putting settlement as such, they're trying to assign a stiffness to this great big mass of soil. Um, and which, when you think about it, it's, it's quite an irrational thing to try and do. If you imagine a footing uh, <coughs> uh, sitting on the surface and you load it up, you can imagine that there's a whole range of different, um, different modes of, of failure. You can see right near the edge of the footing, you're getting the, 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 um, the, the material is, is under a very high shear stress and it's probably got virtually no shear stiffness, <coughs> whereas the material directly beneath uh, the centre line of the footing uh, is experiencing an increase in, in um, volumetric stress, um, a decrease in volume, it's probably becoming quite stiff. So to kind of try and assign a single G or E value uh, to an entire so mass of soil um, seems like a fairly futile Exercise, and it turns out that it, it really um, doesn't actually work. So, the overall sort of, um, I guess, idea behind this was, was: can we kind of treat this in a sort of more rational approach? And if we do, how, how, where do we end up? What, what sort of, um, what sort of success will we, will we have? I guess before we sort of define, um, before we sort of go about that, we kind of really need to define what modelling is. 
um, and we'll sort of establish a, a rational approach. And, and to me, I don't, I'm not sure if there's a textbook definition of what modelling is, but to me it's extrapolating from what you know to try and forecast something you don't know. Um, and as geotechnical engineers, the stuff we know in advance of uh, an event uh, is the things we can get from in-situ testing and things we can get from, from laboratory testing. So, you know, seismic CPT and, and, um, and triaxial sort of pressure tests and so on. Um, the information that we had. <coughs> and so somehow we need to build that into a model that then gives us a, 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 a reasonable forecast. So the quality of the forecast is obviously going to depend on a number of things. It's going to depend on um, the quality of the known data. Um, and I think in, in our profession we sort of tend to get hung up on the fact that we, we have a lot of problems measuring um, the response of, of the ground without in, in a sort of um, in a reasonable way. So any time we take a sample, we obviously disturb it. Um, we, there's really limited sort of range of stress paths we can follow in a lab. Um, and I guess people really sort of question how. Um, how uh, how relevant and how um, how useful some of that data is. Um, again, the quality of the prediction is going to depend on how well we can represent the boundary conditions of the actual problem. Um, I don't think this is a, a major challenge for, for um, some square shallow foundations. Um, and then, if we sort of process this known data, then again, the, the, the quality of our prediction is going to depend on how well our material model or our constituent model can function outside the range of of the data that we know. So, you know, we might be able to match tracks of compression tests really well, but um, the stress path that we can't measure, how well does it match, you know, real soil response um, <coughs> under those conditions. Okay, so um, basically the idea with this, um, this uh, work was just to test an approach that kind of respects this modelling process. So we, we, we're taking the known data, we're treating it as if it is a good representation of the site, um, we're respecting the data, um, and we're seeing what the model outcome is, is going to be. I think the only real way you can do this is with, with a finite element method, or some sort of similar numerical approach. Um, and that's because you don't have to derive some imaginary stiffness for the entire soil mass. You can use a, a realistic hardening elastoplastic type soil model, which gives you some sort of um, idea or, or accounts for the changes in stress, the changes in strain at different locations within the soil mass. Um, and constituted models are built from stress-strain response, and when, when you implement them in a finite element model, you can, you can integrate up and you can, you can get the stress the force displacement or stress-strain response of the boundary value problem. And that allows you to, um, to uh, calibrate the model against um, different boundary value uh, problems. Okay, so if you decide that finite element modeling is, is the way to solve this problem, then the challenge is really then you need to choose a material model and you need to select its parameters. Um, and it's interesting that given the wide availability of, um, of constitutive models um, in the public domain, commercial software packages, no one used a hardening soil model or a, or a, or a sophisticated soil model in this competition. Um, which to me suggests that people either lack confidence in these models or there's a lack of guidance in how to use them. Uh, <coughs> okay, so. Based on that, I think what we need is, is really simple models that capture enough of the key features um, that can give us some sort of realistic handle on what's happening without being overcomplicated, without sort of um, incorporating features that aren't important. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do is sort of start with an elastic perfect plastic um, <coughs> uh, constituent model, um, identify some of the weaknesses in terms of um, what real soil data kind of tells us. Um, and then talk about some of the sort of um, enhancements that, that were made. So, if you um, consider some, some real, real soil stress strain type response, so we've got shear stress here, shear, uh, shear strain on the bottom axis, shear stress. This is sort of what, what you typically see. Um, elastic, perfectly plastic models uh, give you um, just a linear elastic response um, up until failure, and then you get. Um, you know, a flat line. Um, the problem with this is that um, engineers tend to recognise that stress strain response is non-linear well before you get failure, uh, and so there's a lot of uncertainty as to what is the relevant stiffness to choose. So would you, would you choose some sort of lower bound stiffness like this, or would you choose some sort of upper bound stiffness like this? Um, would you choose something in between? 
depends on the problem, and I think a lot of people kind of you know ch- vary their choice depending on the sort of problem they're, tr- they're trying to deal with. Um, I think one of the major issues here is that not all engineers would select the same same value of stiffness because um, there's really no clear route to selecting at this linear elastic stiffness for these elastic perfectly plastic models. I think with um, with collapse problems, it's sort of a different story. I think most engineers would sort of be able to select you know, roughly the same um, strength, whether they're using a more Coulomb type model or a Tresca type model. Um, and so you don't have those sort of, uh, sort of issues with, with elastic perfectly plastic models when it comes to collapse. But when it comes to uh, deformation type problems, it's really important to be able to get the entire stress strain uh, curve. <coughs> and elastic perfectly plastic really doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't cut it. <coughs> Um, also in the um, in the volumetric sense, so if we look at uh, some volumetric strain versus, say, shear strain data, we typically see um, uh, loose samples tend to um, tend to contract and continue to contract until they reach some sort of critical state. Dense soils will maybe contract initially before dilating and then reaching some sort of critical state. Whereas elastic, perfectly plastic models, you'll see no um, no volume strain, no plastic volume strain anyway until you get failure and then you'll see infinite uh, or ongoing um, dilation or, or contraction depending on how you set your, uh, your dilation angle. So it's actually really hard to fit um, an elastic perfectly plastic model to real data. Um, so you know, choosing a dilation angle in this, um, if, if you're using a model like this um, is actually quite, quite difficult. Okay, so the aim with the EMC model, this extended more cool model, is to um, develop a, a simple hardening version of the more cool model which overcomes these, these basic limitations. So we're able to model, model a reasonable stress strain response um, plus get the, um, the volumetric response. So the stiffness of the model falls steadily um, as, the, um, as the material is sheared towards failure. Um, you get plastic volumetric strains, either contraction or dilation, um, before you reach your ultimate um, strength. And we want to make sure it's simple to apply. So this model um, was originally formulated um, by David Muir Wood. I think a number. Of, I think he's been using this model um, for a few years as a sort of teaching uh, model. Um, and he, and he, you know he goes about deriving these really nice, um, elegant uh, constituent models and then sort of parks them on shelf. So when I was over in um, um, Dundee in 2011, I thought it'd be uh, nice to try and sort of code this up and and see how it actually. Performed when we applied it to a real boundary value problem. So in the next few slides, basically I'm just going to go through um, the four components of this EMC model. So four basic components of any elastoplastic model are your elasticity component, yield surface, flow rule, and, and your hardening, hardening rule. Talk very briefly about the um, implementation of the model, um, and then um, in a bit more detail about how the model is applied, because that's really, I guess, what the what the talk is meant to be about. Okay, so um, elasticity is very easy uh, in this or a very simple model in this um, in this particular soil model. It's just uh, a linear elastic model with two parameters, so shear modulus, Poisson's ratio. Um, there's no nonlinear um, uh, part associated with it. <coughs> there are um, a number of sort of quite elaborate nonlinear elastic models, um, but the idea with the EMC model is we use um, plastic shear strain and plastic hardening to uh, get our uh, degradation and stiffness, not some sort of uh, uh, non-linear elastic formulation to get that. Um, and you'll see later that you get a nice response and it sort of keeps the model quite simple. The second part, the yield surface, there, <coughs> there are two things to um, well, two things to consider. First of all, what we do is we define a, um, a failure surface, and that's defined in terms of a peak friction angle, which I've defined as phi p. Um, and we have a, a yield surface, um, which is defined in terms of phi y. Um, and what phi y represents is basically the maximum previous shear stress that this material has seen. So if you're at a stress state here, then you're in, in an elastic zone, um, and you'll load elastically up until you hit this uh, yield surface. Um, and you can think of a material in this zone as being sort of oversheared or maybe it's, um, it's developed uh, some sort of age or some sort of structure which has sort of forced um, this yield surface out uh, and forced your material to be in an elastic um, state. 
excuse me, if you're sitting here, then basically you're in a, um, in a, in a plastic zone and any, um, uh, any sort of stress part that takes you further out is going to pull this yield surface out with you. So this yield surface will move out um, as phi y as a hardening parameter and it will increase up until a value of phi p, um, which is the peak friction angle. Uh, we use um, a parameter called A to define the, um, the attraction in the model. So basically, instead of using a, um, a, a cohesion in the model, we use attraction. The reason for that is that it's much simpler to deal with because um, if we anchor this um, yield surface through this point, this point doesn't change as um, it rotates about this point, but your cohesion will be constantly updated. Um, so uh, that's an advantage of using attraction. So um, as I go through this, I, I'm going to just um, number the model parameters. So parameters one and two were shear modulus and Poisson's ratio. Parameters three and four are the peak friction angle and the attraction. Um, and this uh, green parameter here is a, um, is, you can think of it as a state parameter. So you define this in your initial conditions, um, but it changes throughout the analysis. So it sort of hardens up to, up, up to your peak value. So yeah, a little bit like you would define, say, an OCR or a void ratio when you're using, say, camp line or something like that. Okay, um, and later um, we'll introduce a hardening rule that relates to the value of phi y to some plastic shear strain. Um, the third part of the model is the flow rule. Um, before getting to the actual flow rule that's used, you can consider a couple of options. Elastic perfectly plastic models use a, um, a plastic potential that's just defined in terms of a dilation angle. Uh, and if we opted to do that, so if we specified these plastic potentials which are shown in dotted lines here, defined by some dilation angle uh, there, then you would always have uh, gradients to the plastic potential in the same direction, regardless of, where, of which yield surface you were sitting on. Just about this plot, incidentally, um, this is a plot of shear stress versus, uh, versus uh, mean stress, and sort of overlaid on this plot are plastic shear strains and plastic volume strains. So the superscript P represents plastic, the super, uh, subscript Q, shear, um, and here P and P represent plastic and um, mean stress, or, or, or volumetric strain, sorry. Um, and these ve this vector here is just a, the vector summation um, of, of your incremental plastic volume strain and your incremental plastic shear strain. So that's the sort of uh, that's the response we would get if we chose a constant dilation angle. The alternative would be, or the obvious alternative might be an associated flow rule. So these could all be um, yield surfaces. You can imagine these yield surfaces rotating out as phi y increases. And if we adopted an associated flow, then what we would end up having is a model that started out with zero dilation, because it's purely vertical, um, down here, and increasing in dilation as, as you shear. And neither of these responses really um, match uh, any type of soil data. So the actual, the, the, the dilation, or the plastic potential that is used, um, is basically, um, is originally derived um, by Taylor, 1948. And really all this says is that the ratio, the ratio of your plastic volume strain to your plastic shear strain um, is, e is equal to your ratio of your shear stress to your mean stress minus some parameter. So here, phi CV is just the model parameter. Um, and when this second half of the equation is equal to the first half of the equation, then this whole equation is equal to zero, meaning you have um, constant volume shearing because your, your mean plastic strains are zero. So the first term represents basically mobilised stress, the second term is a material constant. Um, and we introduce another parameter. What that essentially looks like um, in, a, in a PQ graph is, is this, this, um, this dilatancy law ends up giving you um, plastic potentials um, which look like these dashed lines here. So when you're at very low stress, you get a material which is which is contracting. So vectors pointing um, uh, down this p-axis um, indicate contraction. As your shear stress increases, the vectors become more vertical, meaning you get, you're getting less contraction 
eventually you get to a point where your vectors are vertical, meaning you're at a critical state, so you're getting no plastic volume strain. Um, and then as you go beyond that um, particular mobilised stress, you start to get um, a dilation response. So that um, introduces our, our, as I said, introduces our fifth model parameter. Um, the, the final part of the model is, is the hardening rule. Um, basically what this does is introduce a relationship between your plastic shear strain and your mobilised um, friction, phi y, um, and it's done through this fairly simple equation. Um, basically what this suggests, or what this kind of indicates, as this um, uh, phi y approaches phi p, this term on the bottom approaches zero, and your shear strains go to infinity. Um, and this parameter beta um, represents the plastic shear strain when you've mobilised 50% of your uh, shear strength. So when phi y over phi p is equal to a half, that's your parameter beta. It's plastic shear strain. Okay, so that's the, basically the model derived. It's, um, it's got six model parameters, um, so it's only got one more parameter than the more cool plastic, perfectly plastic model. Uh, in addition, you need to set phi y um, in the initial conditions, just like you need to establish your initial stresses. Um, for sands, um, plasticity occurs almost immediately, so you probably you'd set that quite close to your initial mobilised friction angle, based on whatever your penal conditions were. Uh, model implementation, um, I implemented this in a, in a Fortran subroutine uh, to run in a, a UMAP in Abacus uh, using explicit port oiler integration scheme, which um, is basically out of Andrew's, uh, Andrew Abbo's work in Scott. Um, so, the next thing I thought I'd do is just go through um, a couple of quick um, simulations of, say, triax, drain tracks or compression response, just to see the sorts of, uh, sorts of responses that are possible from this model. So, just using some simple parameters, these, um, the important parameters to really to note are that we're going to run three different simulations. Um, all of them are going to have um, a peak friction angle of 30 degrees, but we're just going to vary the constant volume friction angle um, between, of, uh, at values of 20, 30 and 40 degrees. <laughs> um, so what you see when, um, when your constant volume friction angle is equal to your, um, your peak friction angle, um, you start out on a stress path that uh, runs up like this. As you go up, you start from um, quite uh, strongly inclined vectors, which means you get large amounts of plastic um, uh, uh, contraction, um, and then they start to um, become more vertical. Um, so you're, you're getting less contraction and you're starting to, um, uh, when you ultimately get to a, a mobilised friction angle of 30 degrees, um, your vectors are vertical, so you end up getting to a critical state, even though it's not quite shown on this, on this figure here. Um, because there is some elastic response here as well. Um, If we have a situation where we set our constant volume friction angle to be less than our peak friction angle, then what we find is that um, as we um, shear up through, oops, sorry, I'm on that page, um, we start out of the stress path there, we um, shear up to a point, and at this point, at a mobilised friction angle of 20 degrees, our vectors become vertical. Uh, our response in the compression plane um, shifts from uh, contracting to dilating, and then as we continue to shear, we, we uh, get, get this dilate, dilating response. Um, contraction is positive, or contraction is is negative values. Yeah, contraction is positive. Oh, sorry, contraction negative. is negative. Yeah, contraction is down. Normally, in some mechanics, positive. Yeah, normally in cell mechanics, but not necessarily in general FE kind of codes. Real mechanics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so contraction is down. Really confusing me. And this is a situation where um, 
you have your phi CV, so your constant volume friction angle is greater than your peak friction angle, which means you can never actually arrive at your constant volume friction angle. So you shear up to here until you hit um, this line here, which is your peak friction angle. You can't actually reach this, this uh, value here. So you just get um, ongoing contraction. Uh, sorry. So um, basically this is a summary of, of the response. So um, your stress strain uh, function here doesn't change depending on the phi CV that you choose, but your volumetric response depends on um, the difference between your, your uh, peak friction angle and your constant volume friction angle. So this model um, doesn't actually represent a lot all the features of, um, of real soil behaviour. There's only one set of parameters that actually gets you to a critical state. So you can only get to a critical state if you set your phi CV equal to your peak friction angle. Otherwise, um, if your uh, friction angle, if your constant volume friction angle is greater than your peak friction angle, you never get to a critical state. If your constant volume friction angle is less than your peak, it's constant volume shearing is a temporary state. So you get there and then you move past it and then you continue to dilate essentially indefinitely. You can get rid of those. There are obviously um, uh, sort of quite unrealistic aspects of the model. You can um, overcome those models basically by introducing um, two more parameters. Um, but that sort of uh, increases the complexity of the modeling. So uh, the idea here is to basically just to keep it as simple as possible um, with the idea that this is really for predicting putting settlements. So it's a serviceability problem. Most of the material is not going to strain enough to get the constant volume anyway. So, uh, so you know, we think it's sort of um, adequately complex. Uh, these are the simple shear, these are sort of undrained simple shear stress paths. So, um, again, with different, um, different values of phi CV relative to the uh, peak friction angle. So, uh, if your peak friction angle, in this case our peak friction angle is 30 degrees, so if we choose a constant volume friction angle of 30, what you see is you get contraction um, around until you basically get constant volume shearing and then basically you're shearing at a, at a, at a constant um, uh, shear stress. If your uh, phi CV is less than your peak, basically you, you contract initially before you start to dilate and then you will dilate indefinitely. Uh, and the other option is you, if your phi CV is less then you basically contract continue to contract indefinitely until you basically liquefy uh, the material. So that's the, um, the, the, the response in sort of constant volume simple shear or undrained type problems. Um, one of the nice things about this model, I think, and one of the nice things about the sort of approach um, David Newwood takes uh, to his uh, model formulation is that the mo models tend to be sort of uh, built on simple models and additional features are added, which means that um, you can basically set a few parameters and get back to a, a simple model. So if we set um, the phi y value equal to the peak friction angle, that means that basically it's going to be perfectly elastic up until you hit the failure surface. Um, and if you also set phi cv equal to the peak friction angle, then you're basically going to get uh, constant volume shearing at that point, which is equivalent to an elastic, perfectly plastic model with zero dilation angle. So what that allowed me to do is just basically set a set a parameter <coughs> or set a few model parameters and validate the model um, numerically. So validate the implementation of the model against some sort of um, commercial uh, phi element packages. So you know, Abacus has a built-in elastic perfectly plastic model. Um, you can set the model that to have zero dilation angle. Um, and so does Plexus. So just comparing the, um, the model response for a particular um, footing size set of stiffness values and so on. So they're more cooler models? They're, um, talking about them. Yeah, they're, so that's Abacus more cooler model and Plaxis more cooler model with the EMC model set to behave as a more cooler model. Yeah. Um, so that sort of gave me a little bit of confidence that the model was implemented in a reasonable way. Does anyone have any questions on the on the model at this point? Yeah, how did you handle the, the corners and the apex? Because Slide 23, it's, it's singular when you get a tensile stress state where A is equal to P dash. Um, yeah. Where, and yeah. also you've got corners yeah. and no, like when you do an explicit stress integration, yeah. Yeah. you've got to deal with the corners. Yeah, so um, I tried a few different ways and the, the way I found ended up working 
um, smooth this with Abacus. Abacus is very, very tight load stepping or very stringent load stepping uh, criteria. Basically, if one single node doesn't converge in terms of residual force or residual mm -hmm. displacement, the whole model stops. So it's not like a, a global kind of error uh, measurement. Um, what I found worked best was basically um, use the a precise form of the more pool and yield surface. Um, and essentially, in the DV toric plane, I used essentially Draca Praga type surfaces. So essentially, circles uh, scribed through the current stress state. That was where how I figured out the gradients. So you kind of avoid the gradients and the um, or singularities in the gradients. Mm -hmm. You actually replaced you placed one gradient with one discontinuity with another though because you've basically got to jump from the more column surface to the Drucker program because you get a yeah it'll work, well, it'll work but it's, yeah so I mean uh, you can round it so that you don't have that so I, it's, I don't know it's hard to I know what you're doing you're just yeah so if, if I'm on this point then I just I'll, I'll just draw a draw a Drucker program yeah. through that and that'll be my gradient from here and I'll just draw a Drucker program through that and that's my gradient. So, um, yeah, I evaluated gradients essentially to uh, a uh, Draco Praga yield. Okay, so in the, in the DV Toric plane, you just use Draco Praga all the time? In the DV Toric plane, I just use more Coulomb as well. And, um, and I had, I guess, I used about um, three or four kPa of attraction, um, which was enough to sort of keep my stresses away from that tensile zone. So I needed about three or four kPa. So not, not perfect implementation. But the problem with the sort of rounding that um, you do, um, I mean I can go is that if that's your if that's your real more cool and yield surface, then in order to get the right response you need to sort of match it up perfectly with the cam clay type yield or plastic potential. So if you sort of round like this, it introduces some sort of uh, mismatch between the uh, between the yield surface and the plastic potential. So I'm kind of figuring, trying to figure out a, a more efficient way of, of dealing with that problem. Um, and it was something I've had a chat with Andrew and, um, and Christian over the last couple of days. So it's a bit of a work in progress. But um, these footing simulations needed about two or 3,000 load steps. So it, well, it's not easy, not easy to do problem. OK, so um, that's more or less the model. Um, now the application of the model. So the recommended process was basically um, derive your elastic stiffness from, from seismic data. So we had two types of seismic data. We had um, in-situ CPT and we had lab, lab bender element data. Um, shear deformation parameters we get from, um, from the triax or stress strain data. Uh, volumetric compression parameter we get from the um, shear strain versus volumetric strain from triax or compression. Um, ideally, you would have the attraction set to zero, um, and the sands maybe a, a, a possible ratio of about 0.2. As I said, I couldn't uh, I couldn't use a, an attraction of, of zero. Okay, so I'm just going to go through each of those steps and just show you the data and show you how the model uh, matched the, the actual data. So um, this is um, is a, a plot of some um, seismic uh, some shear wave oh sorry uh, small strain stiffness values. Uh, as, in, as inferred from um, uh, seismic cone tests. So the two seismic cone tests at the site uh, gave us this kind of response. Um, Barry fitted a, a basically a curve through this data um, and that was one of the um, stiffness profiles I used uh, for the model. There was also some data from um, bender element tests done at different stress levels. And so based on those bender element tests at different stress levels, this is the um, stiffness response. Um, that you get. Um, so I actually used both of these um, to see basically which one gave, gave a better response. So profile one is from lab bender element tests on reconstituted material. Profile two is in situ seismic cone. Um, uh, selecting the shear deformation parameters. Um, this, these are the two tracks of compression tests, so test one and test two. Um, and basically just by fitting the beta parameter um, and the peak friction angle, you can fit the EMC model response um, to this data quite uh, quite nicely. So this is just a plot of the, the shear strain versus um, the mobilised friction angle normalised by your, your peak friction angle. 
in real terms, so in real stress strain response, this is what that same data looks like. So this is exactly the same data just shown um, as a shear stress versus um, shear strain. So you can see that the EMC model matches uh, the first test very, very well. The second test, um, not so well, it kind of misses, misses part of it, but um, um, you know, I guess we can kind of accept the model's, the model's not going to be perfect. Um, and the, the parameters again were, were 32 degrees as peak friction angle and a beta value of 0 0.0015. Uh, the next parameter we need to fit is the um, is the parameter that describes the um, the volume ch uh, changes, um, and this is test one and test two. So uh, <coughs> plastic volume strain versus shear strain, um, and we can fit this uh, EMC response using a, a phi CV of 36 degrees. So basically, what this is sort of um, telling us is that we didn't see any critical state, and we didn't see any tendency this, for this material to dilate. Um, in this data. Admittedly, we only, um, we've only got shear strains up to about 4% here. So we don't have um, really large shear strains and maybe if we had it continued to shear, we would have seen some sort of critical state. Uh, uh, but we didn't, so um, I think that's uh, probably reasonable for, for the sort of problem we're considering where we're probably applying, um, you know, <coughs> I think the displacement is about 5 to 10% of the, uh, of the footing width for the smallest width. Okay, so that's basically um, how you how we derive the model parameters. So we've got two stiffness profiles that we're going to consider. Profile one from Bender Elements, profile two from the Tissue Seismic Cone. A Poisson's ratio of uh, 0.2, which we just figured was fairly reasonable for, uh, for sand. Peak friction angle 32 degrees, which is what the um, tracks of data told us. A phi CV of 36 degrees. Again, tracks of data told us that. An attraction value of 4 kPa, which is which I needed for some sort of numerical stability, um, and a beta value of um, 0 0.0015. Um, <clears throat> in addition to these parameters, what you need to do is set the initial conditions. The unit weight we took is 18 um, kilonewtons per meter cubed, and a K naught of 0.43. Um, that was after some uh, work by Barry Mahan. Uh, um, I think he sort of arrived at that looking at some pressure metadata, but. Um, I mean, it seemed like a reasonable sort of uh, value. The other thing we need to set is this um, this phi y parameter, so the initial mobilised friction angle. Um, and the way we arrived at that is if we take the um, stress strain response from the um, triaxial data, shear stress strain, uh, you can plot a sequence stiffness versus versus strain on a logarithmic logarithmic scale. So it's really just um, this data um, with the sequence stiffness plotted and uh, uh, strain plotted on a log logarithmic scale. With triaxial test one, the initial, because it's an anisotropically consolidated test, the initial um, friction angle that's mobilised was, was 18.9 degrees, say 19 degrees at its initial state. So if we set the initial phi y to be uh, equal to the mobilised friction angle, in other words, um, our initial stress state lied was, was precisely on a yield surface, then this is the sort of response we get um, in that uh, view. However, if we increase this um, yield surface about 10% or 5 or 10% above this initial mobilised uh, friction angle, then you get um, an initial elastic response. Um, and this is the initial elastic response we get, and this is the degradation and stiffness that we get out of this model. Um, and you can see it matches the, um, the test data quite, quite nicely. So just by sort of um, essentially dialing up about five or ten percent, um, your, your initial yield surface to be five or ten percent greater than your initial um, mobilised friction angle. Um, and this is um, test two. So this, that was test one. This is test two. Again, increasing the um, the mobilised friction angle about five or ten percent above. Um, or increasing your initial yield surface five ten percent above the initial mobilised friction angle gives you a reasonably good result to run uh, this uh, sequence stiffness data. Okay, in simulating these um, footings, they were square footings. Um, we modelled them as axisymmetric footings with an equivalent area, so we set the radius to give us the same same area as a, as, a, uh, as the square footing, um, and it was done with displacement control. So, really, a summary of the process uh, is 
uh, small strain stiffness values um, from bender element and from shear wave velocity gave us our first two parameters. Um, these are our, our two parameters, mu and g. Uh, triaxial stress strain data gave us our, our next two parameters, so parameters three and four. Uh, the volumetric response in triaxial compression gave us our fifth parameter. Our sixth parameter was just selected for numerical stability. Actually, it was not two, two and a half kPa, it was four kPa. Um, sorry about that. And we then just basically increased our initial fire wire to be about 10% above our initial mobilised friction angle based on the K-nor um, stresses. So basically all that was then fed into, into this numeric model um, and then hopefully the idea was that we, we would see a reasonable response. Uh, and this is the response we ended up getting. So um, this is uh, footing number four and we can see that um, these are the two elastic profiles. So elastic profile one is for the bender element, uh, profile two is for uh, the in-situ size of the cone. You can see the in-situ profile is, is a bit stiffer, so that's the reason you get a stiffer response uh, with profile two. Um, but overall, you get, a, you get a pretty good match uh, following this process. Uh, this is for footing number four. So these are all the footings shown together. So footing uh, number one, two, um, three, and four. Um, so overall, I think we're getting a reasonable match to, to most of them. Um, footing number two, we're probably under predicting the settlements uh, a little bit. Um, but in general, these, these two, two profiles are uh, more or less um, sort of bound. Is footing number one the wide one? Footing number one is the wide one. This one footing number four is a narrow one. Yep. yep. Why, why are you getting a, a pretty distinct collapse pattern for your wide footing. If you look at the actual data, it's clearly with this maximum load capacity. Uh, I think this is. I think this is just a creep episode. Right. Yeah, I think if you kept loading this up, you would it would continue to um, you continue to get uh, some uh, additional load. So I think if I think you're you're getting quite close to capacity for this footing. I think you're still a fair fair way from it here. And I guess that's another thing, like um, these load displacement responses quite clearly are a function of time as well. So, um, you know, creep is going to have the rate you load the footing at is going to be quite important. So you sort of need some sort of pra practical sort of way of dealing with the time dependent aspects of your model. So you kind of need to make sure your, your stiffness incorporates all the creep you kind of expect um, that is going to occur during the life of the footings. Okay, so uh, a summary of the results. Basically, these are these are the footing numbers. So footings one to four. Um, these are the measured settlements at 100 kilonewtons, and then the measured settlements at 180 kilonewtons. Uh, and these are the predicted values, or the back calculated values, I really should say, for pro uh, elastic profile number one and elastic profile number two. So at 100 kp, 100 kilonewtons, and 180 kilonewtons. The two worst. Well, the two biggest differences, just in terms of magnitude, not necessarily in terms of percentage, um, was uh, this one for profile one, which was about uh, two and a half millimetres off um, the actual measured value, and this one here for uh, profile number two, which was about nine millimetres off the actual uh, measured value, about 30, 32 mils. So I think overall, a you know, reasonably decent match. There was a, a process of ranking these footing settlements. Um, the EMC model with pro elastic profile one would have, would have won the competition with the predictions that it made, um, and with profile two it would have come second in the competition with those predictions. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it's interesting to look at these scores. Basically, a negative score, which um, a few people managed to achieve, represents an, um, the average of your eight predictions off by a factor of four or, or more. Um, a score of 20 represents an average of uh, an average of uh, within a factor of two. So, uh, did you publish any names? <laughs> there was no 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 one was named. Just called X or seven. Really. Yeah, yeah, just just participant ID numbers. So there was no no one was named or shamed. <laughs> and I think one of the reasons why why the um, settlement forecasting techniques are really um, quite poor is because they they do try and assign a stiffness value for 
a material that's sort of, that, that behaves, it's behaving very differently spatially throughout the mass of the material. Um, and I think this is a sort of reasonably interesting plot. So you can see contours of this phi y parameter, so you, you mobilised um, friction angle, and you can see that it, the zone of plastic behaviour varies really quite significantly throughout the, um, throughout the loading. So here we've just got self-weight, here we've got um, self-weight plus 50 kilonewtons, self-weight plus 100, self-weight plus 200 and so on. And you can see that the zone where you're getting this uh, virtually zero uh, shear stiffness is, um, is growing um, you know, adjacent to the footing corner, which is, which is what you'd expect. So it makes it very difficult to rationally assign some sort of stiffness that represents that entire mass of material, particularly when, when these things are changing with load um, as well as spatially. So um, I guess, yeah, in conclusion, basically just about everything we do in, 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 in geotechnical engineering relates to building models to forecast something. Um, forecast sort of um, uh, structures in contact with the ground. Um, and the fact we do it quite poorly for this really simple problem is, I think is a major concern. I mean, I think it's sort of, it's a bit of a benchmark problem for, for, for us. Um, so the question is, why, why do we do it poorly? Um, I've come up with, with a couple of um, possible suggestions. Our, our problems are so complex they can't be solved. There are major technical barriers. I think maybe in some geotechnical problems that geotechnical situations, this is, this is true. There are tech, technical barriers and, and some problems are very complicated. I don't think it's uh, true of the footing settlement problem. Um, I just think we kind of um, build models in a way that kind of uh, just, uh, they're built to fail, they don't, they don't really work. And maybe it's just an, it's an old way of doing things. I think you know, we, we sort of need to sort of, um, I think address this problem in a, in a sort of a, a modern way. Um, it's, you know, for the last 50 or 60 years, footing settlements have been treated as elastic problems. They're clearly not elastic problems. Um, we often promote the virtues of quality soil testing. So as academics, we kind of say, well, you know, you really should be doing, to practicing engineers, they should be doing uh, uh, you know, more advanced soil testing and more of it. Um, but evidence is we don't really know how to incorporate it rationally in design. And I think that's where constituent modelling can come in and we can sort of build models that are simple to apply um, that, can, that can actually suck this data in um, and make reasonable predictions. And, and I think we need sort of... Um, yeah, simple models to do that. I think the EMC model is reasonably promising in this respect. Um, it uses really a simple elastic component, just Hooke's law, um, linear elasticity, more cool on yield surface. Most engineers are, are very familiar with that. Um, the original cam play flow rule, you would have been familiar with those, um, those the shapes of those plastic potentials. Um, and just a simple hardening parameter. I think we might, the, the parameters are sort of really derived from, um, you know, in a kind of simple, sort of neat, neat kind of way. Um, the references that for this, I guess if you want to sort of read a little bit more about the prediction competition, there's um, the reference there. Um, email me and I can send you the paper. Um, and there's also the a geotechnical paper which talks um, in detail about the UMC model. Uh, and finally, I just want to acknowledge um, David Neil Wood, who, um, who is the original developer of this UMC model um, and uh, all his help uh, in putting this together. And also Barry O'Han, who's very generous in uh, donating his data. So, thank you. Thank you.